There we go. You've got your room mic on. So it should disappear here in just a second. That's what they told me anyway. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm up from uh, the northwestern Pennsylvania, and uh, room mic called. I don't have my room mic. I guess I should have checked that. I told you I was a room. Can everybody hear me? JV, this thing on? By now. Good. Yes. Good. JB? Good. All right. He's sitting in the back to pray to call on. <laughs> he got me good earlier. Okay, our farm, my farm's 200, 220 acres actually, and not, we have 130 acres of pasture. That's my entire tilled of land. We have a lot of uh, different species on the farm. We have cattle, sheep, goats. Honeybees, we do some custom grazing. We're using adaptive management. We don't have a recipe card for what we do on the farm. We do what's necessary to make the soil as healthy and productive as possible. So we're moving four times a day. Today we might not necessarily need to move that many times tomorrow, but down the road we may need to, you know, another day we may need to to rotate our livestock 10 times a day to achieve our, our goals. We're, we're, we are reducing our inputs. Uh, we used to grow corn and make a lot of hay. We've, since then, we've sold our corn picker when we've also sold our hay making equipment. We're buying hay for approximately 75 days out of the year. This is a picker of my farm. Um, this here is my confinement. If soil's too too uh, unstable for livestock to be out there, that's that's where they're at. If my entire farm's perimeter fenced, and then we have I guess there's about thirty thousand feet of fence there. And then we have a split down in our interior fence. We have to split down into little fields. There's 40 some, 40 plus paddocks there. And uh, we'll split them down even further with portable fencing. Uh, just an example, that farm, when the first graze across the farm, it may be split down as many as 700 times. The last two years, we've rotated livestock 3,000 times on the farm. This is the livestock we're managing on the farm. Uh, the top four, and there's a lot more that can go in that list, those are the more, most important things that are on my farm. And whenever you're dealing with a, or working with an ecosystem, those guys are a very, very key part of your ecosystem to keep it productive and profitable. See here, we increase and decrease our animal units in the spring and the summer. I like to have 90 to 120 animal units. And then in the fall and the winter time, we try to decrease that as much as possible. We do a lot of, the dairy heifers work very, very well for that. We started dairy, uh, custom grazing dairy heifers last year and um, works very, very good to offset that springtime flush. That's one of the challenges that we're having without making hay. And of course, man, we use a thousand pounds of animal. This is probably one of the reasons that I do what I do and is I've traveled through life growing up on a dairy farm and um, having many, many businesses of my own which were all successful. Um, in order for a business to sustain, it has to be profitable. And it has to have a little extra money in the bank. And as you read through the literature and, and all the studies and research, up to 80% of the American farmer just break even or lose money. That's not acceptable for me if, or if I want to work full time as a farmer. I cannot, just to be in business, I, I cannot do that. So 
we look at, there's many, many, many research papers out there. There's, there was just a new one come out last week from the uh, Illinois, University of Illinois. They pretty much, every one of them, these here seem to be the two top problems. Stored feed costs, and, and that stored feed cost, the, um, the leading input is human labor. The second input is fossil fuel in the forms of diesel fuel, gasoline, and our fertilizer. And then of course we have our equipment depreciation costs. If I don't have the equipment, I use to depreciate. Um, I've had people ask me what I invest in. I invest in stock, livestock. This here is my farm. Uh, we keep a lot of records on the farm. Um, in 2012, we were able to get 120 grazing days. And we made a lot of hay that year. We had 45 animal units. 2016, we had 294 grazing days. And we had 90 animal units. What's the most interesting thing to me on this whole, whole slide? 2012, we spent $26,000 in fertilizer. We spent $2,400 in plastic to wrap our hay. And plus, we purchased 3,500 gallons of diesel fuel. 2016, we purchased 200 gallons of diesel fuel. And 1 of the most interesting things of this whole thing is, we doubled our carrying capacity and we reduced all those inputs. On a small farm, that's going to make a lot more profit just by itself. And over the three year period, we were actually able to achieve 286 grazing days. The goal on our farm, one of the goals that we have on our farm was 300 grazing days. We've kind of upped the ante on that a little bit. I want to be up to 365 grazing days. That's the only reason I haven't been over the, month, the number I have. Am I going to make 365? Perhaps not. But I would really have to with 340 days and only have to be hay for 25 days out of the entire year. We try to keep things simple. Um, I know some folks think that some of the things that we're doing aren't really simple, but once you make the transformation and, and look at things a little different, it's a lot simpler. And simple and it takes a lot less time to do a lot of planning. Last week I was planning where my livestock are going to be at on this same exact day next year. I know which field they're going to be in and what they're going to be in. Record keeping, we're going to go into some record keeping, maybe perhaps help some, some of you folks with some record keeping here later. Low stress, we need to keep it low stress for me, the livestock, our grass, our our underground livestock. Soil nutrient recycling is very, very, very important to us. Um, we're pulling the fertilizer out of the system, the cows eat, the cows, sheep, goats, whatever. If they eat um, any forages, it needs that those nutrients need to be deposited back on our soil right where they came from. Livestock must work for a living. This is a business. There's no free ride on my farm. If, there's, if they're not able to make it, we call them to find them in their homes. Try to be reduced labor. Some of this is going to sound kind of a lot to you, but it is actually a lot less labor intensive. Those 3,000 loops was a lot less labor intensive than what it would be if I was making the hay, hauling them in the north, feeding the hay, and doing the bedding and playing the cattle. We're not, no longer using vaccinations in the herd. Everything seems to be a whole lot healthier. We used to be on a first name basis with the veterinarian in 2012. Just a lot of, was on our farm quite a bit. I haven't seen a vet in two and a half years, maybe three years. We're not using any wormers. What we're doing is we're breaking the fly cycles, or we're breaking the parasite cycles, and hopefully I can get into this a little deeper with our soil nutrient recycling, having those, those uh, beneficial insects. We're not using any fly control. We use the double gear tag 
supply tags. We used to put spray-ons all over the cows. We never did use the internal insecticides. But today, do we have flies? Absolutely. But we have no more flies than what we did when we were doing all that other stuff. <coughs> we do not seek shade. You see, while well, you're up there in northwestern Pennsylvania, it doesn't get very warm. There's a lot of days it's probably 90, 95 degrees. What we do is we look for a heat index at 84 degrees. <coughs> and once we get to that heat index, we start counting respiration rates. The respiration rates get to 100, we go to shade. But if we don't need shade, does it mean we don't know where we're going to go if we have to? We have that, we know where those cows are going to be if we need shade. If it's even back to the confinement area. We're not clipping pastures. I feel if we're clipping, if you're clipping your pastures, you're cutting your solar panels off and uh, losing some potential uh, grass growth and potential tonnage that your livestock can actually eat. We're not dragging pastures either. If you break that lawn that north from the soil, if you break that lawn, it's not going to break down as quickly. We want our cow patties to break down and be gone in 21 days in a good, normal, you know, if it's cold out like this and our, our microbes and stuff aren't working quite as, quite awake yet, they're not going to break down that quickly. We want the cow patties to break down in 21 days. If they're not broke down in, those, in that time period, we're out looking to try and figure out what's wrong with our system. There's something wrong with our biological system. She's not the man. She used to be. In my area, we have 180 growing days, <coughs> grass growing days, 185 non grass growing days. Uh, as are averages. This winter, it's been a little odd. Um, so, what do we do if we? Uh, what do we do for the 185 days when the grass isn't growing? feeds the work feeds or we do stockpile. And that's pretty much what we like to do. This is some of the work that we have our lives or our employees do. Harvesters, I'm no longer harvesting nothing. Brush hogs, I used to want a brush hog. I thought that I needed to clip my pastures, but I really didn't. I just needed to learn how to manage them. Lawn mowers, I no longer cut my grass. I've actually fenced my yards in and my driveway up along my driveway we fenced that in the those now. Manure spreaders, it's a whole lot easier to have them spread the manure. And one of the interesting things, if we can have them do it, whenever it comes out of the, the livestock, or at least in the cows, their manure is almost a perfect pH. If you put that manure in storage, it actually gets acidic and it could cause you a potential pH problem in your soils. Seed planters, that's my preferred method. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Whatever other crazy thing we can figure out that there's something that needs done in the farm, we try to figure out how to make these do it. Because anytime you put a piece of equipment between you and your livestock, it's potentially costing you too much money. We use a lot of high stock density grazing. We see a lot of benefits. We're able to disturb the system the least by a high stock density grazing. There's 90 animal units in that picture. That's a, that's a one season grass field. But what we're doing is we're mimicking nature. You see, study and look at, we look at, or try to pattern the farm on a lot of things that happen in nature. Something goes wrong, we try to figure out what would that, what would happen on if that was occurred to me naturally. We're going to have a lot less system disturbance, living system disturbance. If we move the cows in, we move them in, get them on, maybe six months before they're back onto that piece of land. When we were on a one day rotation, the cows would maybe go across the farm three or four times in an entire year. Last year we made it across our farm about two and a half times. Some of those fields, depending on what management they needed, we only grazed them once and that was it, the livestock went over back. We're going to have faster soil nutrient recycling. Natural.
likely we're going to have less erosion, less time caring for livestock. I've given the argument with a lot of producers about this. Trust me, it's a lot less time. I can set fence, tear fence out, move the cows four times a day in an hour and a half to keep the water with them. And of course, your livestock are a lot healthier. My vet hasn't been on a farm. I did run into him into sheets one day and uh, we caught, caught up and kind of wondered if I got a different veterinarian. He said, no, not really. We just going really well. We wished each other the best and the way we went. This is what 300,000 pound stocking rate looks, looks like. A lot of times throughout the summer, this is pretty much how it is. We move four times a day. One of the most interesting things, we put them in that 300,000 pound stock density, and then we loosen them up and put them in this year's a 50,000 pound stock density. If we loosen them up, there's not a fence in front of these animals. When they're in a high stock density situation, they're competing for their food. They're going to take a bite, and their buddies, uh, you know, they're trying to get the bite of their buddy, might want to steal from them. But whenever you do that, you loosen them up, they'll go unison, shoulder to shoulder across the field. I've counted 43 cows abreast working across the field in a straight line in unison. It's pretty amazing. It is simply amazing. Soil nutrient recycling. This here is really, really important if I'm not putting fertilizer on. You see, this is all manure pads evenly distributed across the field. We try to achieve this every time we graze a paddock. We need to get that. And we also keep water in each paddock. Had a lot of learning experiences over the years here. I took this out of the NRCS pasture, uh, pasture health guide. I want to look at who? I want to look at Cassie producing 250 pounds of beef. Produce 250 pounds of beef, I'm going to pull 0 0.7 pounds of potassium out of the soil. If I produce 4 tons of hay, I'm going to take 160 pounds of potassium out of the soil. So if we look at that, I'm going to have to graze the cows or produce 57,000 pounds of beef. Remove the same amount of potassium as it would for me to make hay in one year. So grazing those cows out on a, or your livestock out in your, out on that system, you're not pulling those soil nutrients like you were if you were to make hay. If you were to make hay, um, I used to be told that you can mine the nutrients out of the soil. Effectively, I was when I made hay. I pulled the nutrients out. I put it in the barn. I locked it up for perhaps six, eight months, and the soil was depleted of those nutrients unless I applied the fertilizers to it. We strive for big, fat night crawlers and earthworms. Tim, he comes to the farm every once in a while, he's got where he brings his snake boots. This here is an earth, or a night crawler midden, and they're up to a quarter of an inch around the circle on seeing some pretty good sized night crawlers. <coughs> but this here is very, very interesting to me. This is very heavy clay soil. It's almost impermeable by water. But we have these earthworm channels working down through there. They're helping get those root systems down into the lower layers. We're helping infiltrate water. We're able to access more nutrients those plants are able to access more nutrients. We're incorporating organic material. We know for every 1% of organic material, we're going to gain uh, approximately one inch or 27,000 gallons of water holding capacity. Our dung beetles, they're the main reason I quit using worms in my, my herd and my flock. Um, it took us three years to get our dung beetles back on the farm. Years before I seen any dung beetles. They're a very, very, very small part of my system, but they're actually really, really beneficial. They can help me reduce my worm flies, my face flies. They're going to help get those worm cats recycled back into the soil. 
Um, so we're going to actually reduce our parasite loads in our livestock. Plus, we're going to get those nutrients back into the soil so that can recycle back into the plant and, and get potential plant growth. We do a lot for the wildlife. These guys are really beneficial. Uh, some folks don't think so, but these guys are very, very beneficial and they play a, a huge key on our farm. You see here the tree swallows sitting on the nest of six eggs. We have 70 bluebird nest boxes. Um, about 20 of those are, uh, have bluebirds in them, nesting pairs of bluebirds, and then the rest of them are pretty much taken over by the tree swallows. These tree swallows are like uh, little jet pipers flying amongst the cows taking flies out. They're very, very beneficial. In the fall of the year after they fledged a couple uh, nests, nests of birds, I've seen as many as maybe a hundred. Those guys can take a lot of flies out today. And then of course we have our, our mega mouse or voles, I guess some folks call them. They actually dig a tunnel about six inches deep down into the surface and they'll take this uh, dead, dead uh, decaying matter, they'll pull it down in there, they'll make a nest. They're actually taking that down in there. You know, comforts a home, but they're actually making that uh, helping some cluster of organic material. And we know what organic material can do for our soils. We have our gardener snake. And if you look right here, he's got one of these guys in the belt. Last year, for the first time, we found snake skin that were six feet long on our farm. I'd really like to see those snakes. I can't identify them, but we had snake skins or where they shed their skin that were six feet long. We've never seen those before. Of course, our pollinator insects. Um, we know our spiders are going to take out a lot of our uh, take out a lot of our fly problems, and then of course our beneficials, our pollinators. Do we have any crop producers in here? Nobody. Okay, everybody's livestock. Okay. I won't go into it then. Talking to the water producers, I always tell everybody it takes grass to make grass. When I tell them, just consider take half, leave half. That doesn't uh, seem too appealing to a lot of folks, but hopefully after today you might think about it and it uh, may change your mind, hopefully. Whenever I can say take half, leave half, you need to consider the plant is denser at the base of the plant. So if you have a 24 inch plant, you may be taking 18 inches off six inches. This here is what I consider take half, leave half. It's probably trampled a little heavier than I like. I like to leave 20% standard, trample 30%. There's a lot of things going on here. A lot of folks think this is wasteful, and I used to at one time think it was very wasteful, but there's a lot of things that's happening there. We're armoring that slow with this, this uh, trampled plant matter. That trample plant matter is doing a lot, especially in the, in the armor. We're helping keep the soil cool. We did some tests and I, I took some uh, temperature readings on a free farm, my farm, and a couple of the other farms around me. And one was a severe, severely overgrazed pasture. He had white clover in reproductive stage, it was less than a half an inch high. Those were very struggling plants. But in that soil temperature, those guys' the soil temperature was 10 degrees warmer than what they were in this situation. We're shading that soil, and we're actually able to keep those grasses grow longer into the season. As we know, tall fescue usually stops growing when the soil temperature gets to 86 degrees. It doesn't take in a, an overgrazed system. It was 10 degrees warmer than me, and it started about 15 to 20 days earlier, so there was a lot of growth that wasn't there. We're armoring that soil for soil compaction. How can that get soil compacted if the cows are not going to be back for six months? I'm talking about the rainfall. There's a lot of energy that hits, the, hits that soil. 
an example in 2015 from January 1st to July 9th, we had 28 inches of rain. There's approximately 45,000 raindrops in an inch of rain. We're in a gallon of water, there's 27,000 gallons of water in an inch acre of rain. And basically what that equates to on my 220 acre farm is seven billion raindrops hitting the surface of the soil. But if this year was not fully covered, and by the way, I had an engineer figure this out, it's energy equivalent to moving 70 square meters of soil. That's a lot of soil disturbance. So we're helping with the erosion. Just think about that, seven billion raindrops on my farm. That's a lot of destruction. So why am I taking half, leaving half? Dwayne, you're late. So why am I taking half, leaving half? This year is one of the main reasons that I take half, leave half. I want these roots to continue to grow. If I take more than half of that plant, Say we take 60%, we're going to trim those roots back. It's going to be less moisture, we're going to be able to access and less nutrients. Let's say we take 80%. This year's pretty much what 80% of grazing looks like. We come into these seed. Whatever location you were, it was extremely dry last year in northwestern Pennsylvania, and as I talk to producers across the state, it seems to be that way. If I overgraze, have my roots sloughed back, there's going to be a lot of potential growth that's going to be lost. This here's the same same thing, just in the, looking at it a different way. We knew this in 1955 while we were grazing. Carbohydrate, our plants, they produce sugars, energy, starches, proteins. One of the most important things to take away from this slide is it must photosynthesize to feed the plant first. Before it can feed the livestock. And this here doesn't mean before it can feed the above ground livestock. This means so it can feed the micro herd. There's a lot of energy transfer between the plant and the micro herd. The micro herd feeds the plant and then feed the plant to feed our livestock. 60 to 70 percent of the energy that that plant produces goes into producing sugars, carbohydrates, and proteins. This here's a picture I took off the farm last year. This here's a root here with exudates on the outside of it. So let's take, for example, we have a four inch stand of grass and we have a four foot stand of grass, which one's going to produce more energy for our livestock? It's going to be the four foot stand of grass. <clears throat> so we strive for those nice tall grass. We want to keep the energy flow, keep the system going, keep it revved up. Of course we need those, we need wide, deep wide roots. This here is just a 36 inch pitcher. We have them deeper than that. We're going to produce, we're going to put more organic material into the soil. We're going to have better water infiltration, carbon sequestering, energy from the micro herd. That root zone is down further, the further and larger that root zone gets, our micro herd gets larger also. This here is an exciting plant for me. I really like this plant. Every time we dig this plant out, it's always full of soil life. Always. It's a very that deep rooted plant. Or it's chicory. You want to make lambs shine, put them in the chicory for about three to three weeks. If you want your neighbors to come by and take a lot of pictures of your field, plant chicory. It's fine that neighbors take a lot of pictures of the plants on the farm. That's with that, but my neighbors actually really enjoy this. Roots from the soil depth of 36, look at that cluster of roots. I contribute that to a, a night crawler. A night crawler works, works vertical on the soil surface column. 
earthworms have a tendency to work horizontal. So if you see those, those folds that are going straight up and down, that's probably a night crawl. One of the interesting things with this, if we look at this a little bit closer, there's a lot of roots penetrated through that. That quad's at three feet, dug it out of the past, it was very hard in my excavator, couldn't dig any deeper. Those roots were able to penetrate that very, very hard clay pan, I guess you could say. And in doing so, we're actually making it so our water infiltrates a lot better. If we have high rains, it will infiltrate into the soil, we don't have the runoff off the farm anymore. I can have a five or six inch rainfall event in a very short period of time. I go out and look, there is no runoff off the farm. We're able to sequester that water. And when having that water sequestered, we're able to excessive in dry periods. This is what school, healthy soil looks like. It's a dark chocolate brown. That's, that's a sign of organic material. We have a lot of root systems in there. One thing that this picture doesn't show, I was thinking about when I came down, it seems as of lately we're seeing a lot of extra fungus in this world, which is a very, very good thing. There's a ton of fungus that we need to dig out. We come to the farm, we're going to go on a, go with a shovel and go for a walk and probably spend four hours. Anybody find the earth mark? He's here. He's right here. This here is the soil from two feet down. Aggregate. This is an aggregate, a soil aggregate that's probably about 20 or 30 microns. So it's it's very 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 tiny. But it's very very important. So if we can tie those nutrients up that could possibly be washed away in a in a rain event, if they're tied up in these aggregates and they don't get washed away. They're going to stay there on the farm. And in my case, I don't like the tree due to the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. Here's another root here. You can see the, the root. I believe this here is a fungus attached to the root. Here's another fungus. This here is bacteria floating around that root. Some of the microbes. Anybody who believes in alien life forms on the planet, we may have them. I don't know what that guy is, but he looks like an alien to me. You should probably figure out we have a very, very diverse farm, and our forage is very, very diverse. That uh, broadens our grazing window, keeps us out on the land, it's going to reduce our inputs. We're going to have higher forage production if we're able to let those plants rest. Better balance for ration for the whole system. Not only for the livestock, it's going to be a better balance for your micro herd too. It's a better balance for me too because it's a lot in there. You're going to have a lot of better plant persistence. We have stand elk helper at almost seven years old. They look fairly decent yet for seven year old stand elk helper. Naturally, we need to improve that soil health. We'll turn out in the spring. We usually turn out pretty early. We're trying to stage the stage the growth, the, the growth of grass on the farm. Um, not making hay, we do have that challenge of the spring flush. This year's between 10 and 11 inches, that particular field when we went in there was 16 inches, we just took the top off of it. We're just setting it back a little bit so everything doesn't come right. Here's kind of what our fields look like when we move out. The cattle, livestock. Remember the manager, the old manager on the farm? She's a lot happier now. We've got a lot of these, these guys here, they're fine. And we have our guard dogs guarding our, our goats and kids. We have our full season annuals. This particular field, field here is uh, winter rye, hairy veg, annual rye grass and three or four different clovers. As you can see, she doesn't have to work very hard to get her meal. And this particular field, this is one of the very, very few times that you won't see me back fence field. Because this here is too 
high of the stock density, I'm afraid it's kind of like overflowing a glass of water. Uh, I put them in that very small area that was going to kind of pop out of the fences. We took dry matter yields in this, this uh, particular field. This particular field yielded us almost 7,000 pounds of dry matter yield. Um, that's total. We grazed 60%, and I don't think Jessica's here was earlier, but she helped me take the, the pre and the post. The pre was pretty easy to get, but the post was very, very interesting. Because with those amount of animals, there's not much there that didn't have dung or urine on it. It was very, very challenging to get those uh, dry matter samples in the post. It was, it was simply amazing that the urine and urine was spread very, very evenly in the process. We plant as many warm season grasses as we can. But if anybody that has any experience with them, it's very, they're very, very slow to establish and it takes, it just takes time for it. It's an ongoing process for us. This here's a uh, big blue stem, primarily big blue stem. This here's a primarily big blue stem. And then this here's Indian grass. And then I believe there's 90 animal units in that particular field. One grazing, one season annual. Typically, we like to use this as a stockpile. It's a very good stockpile of forage. Um, however, last year we needed it in the summertime swamps to graze it. But you can see here we got our pumpkins. You can see these little things standing up in the corner field. Those are sunflowers. Um, very diverse. We do not like the monoculture. We have those sim things called symbiotic relationships where one plant uh, benefits from the other plant. Here's uh, just one of the things with biodiversity. We plant our sorghum and sedan grass, but the buckwheat in there, there's also sunflowers in there. That was kind of an emergency crop. We had a failed stand of warm season grasses. We needed to get that soil covered, so we didn't have the erosion problem of having bare soil. So this year, we would get it in, get something growing on that soil just to protect it. We were able to graze it, it wasn't a problem. How about native pastures? How about warm season, cool season, pollinators? Um, native legumes? Anybody know what this is? You know what it is, Dick? Can't say it. Oh, you can't say it. Okay. That's an aster. We planted that aster. It's a plant that a lot of folks, a lot of grazers have challenges with, and it's causes them to lot with those pastures. We do a lot of forage testing across the farm, and one of the interesting things about that New England aster is it had 20, at that stage growth, it had 24 and a half percent pure protein and had 588 calories in it. It was comparable when I was making hay. I went back through my went back through my forage records. It was comparable to better cotton, alfalfa wrapped hay. My forage specialist or my, my nutritionist, I guess you should say, he said it was very very close to corn silage, except for the protein. Corn silage is usually seven and a half percent crude protein. This was twenty four and a half. So um, I'm going to suggest maybe if we can get our livestock to eat that, they're going to maybe break. potentially save yourself some money and time and clip it. We graze our weeds. This cow here, she's not for sale. She's eating bull pistols. <laughs> her, her two daughters. And I have two other cows that eat wolf. The whole herd doesn't need to eat these things. I just have a couple, I'm good to go. Of course, you have to go. Did you train those ones? Excuse me? Did you train those ones? No. no. No, I did not train my, my livestock to eat weeds. Um, with the high stock density grazing and the competitiveness, they basically taught themselves to eat weeds. I have to watch if there's, um, I don't have any really highly toxic weeds. I have some toxic weeds on the farm. They're 
you know, diluted in their rations. Milkweed is considered toxic and can be potentially uh, <coughs> We don't have a lot of it, but we still graze it because it's diluted in their ration. Um, but we do, we are really careful about the toxic weeds. Typically, our milkweeds, we try to fence those guys up because we're trying to help our endangered uh, monarch butterfly. A lot of guys will get the spray can out, and I get my fencing out, and I fence those guys out. And every once in a while, we miss the milkweed, and this is what happens to it. But, okay. This is what happens to uh, the milkweed if I don't get it fenced out on my farm. I have these little sticks sticking up. The livestock, you get they relish it. Um, I'm told by some of the research that I've done that I've done that it could actually help with parasite issues in the sheep and goats. Um, the cows also eat it. This here was grazed by the goats. If the cows graze it, it's usually grazed off the ground. Or 100% no-till. This is my grass drill, big blue stem switch grass seed. Starting to sprout. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my preferred method of seeding. The standard grass was established with this in my livestock. I would go in, I'd graze it with my cows, I'd spread my seed on it, and then I'd graze it, go over with my sheep. The sheep when they're grazing, if you've watched a sheep graze, their feet never stop moving whenever they're eating. In doing so, they're working that seed down into the soil surface and getting that seed to soil content. Don't try this one if you try it out. You know, you use, use some common sense um, whenever you're doing it because you could have mixed results. Typically, I like to do it in the fall of the year that way. Uh, we get a good growth on it and then in the springtime, when everything starts growing, it actually has, has a chance to compete with the existing plants that are there. We broadcast frost seeding, and a lot of folks are frost, broadcast seeding or frost seeding. This is nothing more than a candy box off of a uh, corn planter or sitting on the weeds, rusting the pieces with a 12 volt motor and a spinner on it. The best part of this whole picture is, is this guy here probably saved me more time on my farm than anything else. $5.20 an hour and a half to build, and you can run all up over this. You can run over all those temporary fences that you set. A lot of times I have 10 temporary fences set. I go in the field, I don't need to slow down, we run them over, do what we need to do, we'll come back out. We don't have to put no fences down or not. Quit making hay, what are you going to do with your hay wagons? Trying to keep our livestock out there, let's build some wind breaks. Temperature zero, 25 mile an hour wind. You could potentially save near 30% energy in your livestock's consumption. It's cold out, and you know, they have to eat a little more to keep themselves warm. But you can see this cow, all these guys, they have snow laying on their back. It's not uncommon to see that snow laying on their back for five or six days straight. It's, it's pretty amazing. We like our biological plants or our biological primers. This here is a cover crop mix that we did in the corn field in 2012. We've done a whole lot of different ones. Um, this here is what we interseeded that into the corn and uh, we planted the corn May 15. And May 20th, and uh, we interseeded this on July 9th. And once this corn starts dying back and the canopy starts opening up, this just explodes. We don't have any bare soil there, so we don't need to worry about our erosion problems. Plus, when we want to graze out with our livestock, it actually balances the ration a little better and makes it a lot better quality. What if we were to put permanent grasses underneath our corn? Use it as a nurse crop instead of using oats. We've had a lot of success. Uh, you've seen Tim speak this morning. This here is a step up from the tub he has over at his place. We can have water 120 animal units in this tub, filled with 13 and a half gallons. The trick is we keep the water with the cows, keep a short garden hose 
Well, I can't say that because we're going off to 1,200 feet, but I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's really hot out, we want to try to keep that garden hose as short as possible. This is filled with 13 and a half gallons, and in doing so, whenever it's really hot out, whenever I go to move my house and I walk there and it's 90 degrees up, the water in that tub is between 55 and 65 degrees. That helps with their temperature and stress, heat stress. Okay, you say, well, Rusty, you can't, uh, I can't move my cows twice a day because I work off the farm. I understand that. The farm will use spring gate releases. Set the timer on that spring gate release. You want to move your cows at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, this and here's one that I made at the barbecue rotisserie motor in a camp. It, it, you know, really, really cheap timer, the five bucks a piece of timers. Um, you want to move at one o'clock. Rotisserie motor, motor turns, trips the camp, spring gate releases, the cows move ahead, the cows move to keep water into the paddock that they're moving ahead on so they don't come back. We're able to move our cows multiple times, get them off that soil before it's overgrazed. How about record keeping on your smartphone? This is something that I discovered late last fall. Does anybody in here have smartphones? <coughs> ah, you could find them. I've been doing a lot of speaking, nobody seems to have smartphones or they're afraid to be called on. This works through Google app or Google Docs. This is actually some of the uh, little forms that I fill out, or some of the records that we keep. We need to keep manure and uh, soil or manure and fertilizer records for our nutrient management plan. We need to keep spray records. Um, but for me, most of my record keeping is grazing records. So let's look at this grazing records. I punch that on my phone, I fill out this form, I hit submit, and it goes into cyberspace. It disappears. Here it is. It goes into cyberspace. It keeps track of all the questions that I filled out. And this is very, very, uh, you can tailor it to your own system. You can keep your <coughs> maintenance records on your tractors. I have a lady who works with NRCS. She keeps a record of everything that's in her freezer. If you can keep a spreadsheet, <coughs> keep a spreadsheet, or keep, if we can keep it on an Excel record, we can do this. The best part of this whole thing is it's free. It's not hard to do. In my opinion, just moving the livestock, put them out on a 24 degree below zero day and having a 15 or 20 mile an hour wind and open the barn. They have never refused to go out to graze when it's that cold. And I've never had them refuse to go out if it's 90 degrees or above. And they're a lot healthier. Basically our summary, we're gonna have Higher financial gain, we have a higher financial gain, we're able to do more for the soil. We can pay a closer attention to the soil. You're going to extend your grazing season, so you're going to have less reduced inputs of feed and hay. We're going to reduce soil erosion because we don't want that down there in the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. You're going to improve soil structure, and if we improve soil structure, we're going to have higher water holding capacity, better water infiltration. So if we have a huge rainfall event, we have five inches of rain, we can trap it in the soil. Whenever it dries up for the next 20 days, your grass will continue to grow. We're going to build organic material. There's a lot of benefits to organic material. We just did some soil testing on the farm. We've actually gained almost a full percent in four years of intensive rotational grazing. But there's been some pretty interesting things that come back on the soil test that I have not been able to analyze yet. Our potassium is coming up without the fertilizer. And our pH is also coming up without putting lime on. You know what? Everything that I do at the end of the day, this is what it's all about. 
this little girl got up at 3 o'clock this morning to give her daddy a hug and a kiss so I could come down here. She got up on her own. But she is my cattle mover. I take her out. Her legs aren't long enough to reach the pedals on my side by side. I take her out. She will move this cow by herself. She's six now, but this picture here, she's five. She's only about maybe this tall, but she's got an attitude. Okay? I don't, she doesn't go with me to move the cows. There's a total meltdown in the house. She moves the water tub. She puts the reel down. She moves the 90 or 100 cows, whatever I have. She puts the fence back up. A six-year-old can do it. Pretty sure most anybody can do it. My son, he's going to be a robot engineer. He's going to help agriculture out. He's going to, he has all these wild, crazy things. He's going to try and make a tractor that flies to help reduce compaction whenever they're driving the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> I partner, I, I work with a lot of different agencies. I work on a, a grazing project with uh, Capital RC and D. Um, there's more video on my farm on Capital R C and D and it should be on the PAA GLC website soon. They actually funded that project, I believe, as a grant. I work with the NRCS USDA. They actually I'm a private grazing consultant for them from time to time as I have time to do so. Penn State, I work with Penn State, they have a uh, integrating livestock into the cropping system. Uh, also, I am a board member on PA GLC, and Penn Soils actually helped uh, organize some of the many, many field day projects we have on the farm. Do we have a couple minutes for questions? Yes, ma'am. The fact that you do not vaccinate, does that pose any problem when you go to sell your cattle? This is what I do. If I have to sell cattle, they want their mom vaccinated, I am happy to do so. I will do that for them. I will let the titers work on in the vaccinations, and then we'll put them on. If they want a worm, we put them on the truck, we dump the wormers on them in the trailer, and away they go. I will not do it on my soil if I can help them. Okay. How often do you find that you've got to receive a pattern? How often do I reseed paddocks? I would say it, it's variant. Um, we have a lot of fescue, which grows a long time. The biggest challenge we have is keeping legumes in them pastures. On average, we put legumes in about every four years, or try to if we can. As far as grass, redoing grass is seven to 10 years, maybe. We have any other questions? Yes, sir. It seems like on, on one hand, it always gets talked about uh, don't breathe in the fall, you know, in, in your pastures because the grass is trying to send carbohydrates back into the roots and whatnot. But then you go to another class and they say you can extend your grazing season to three you know, So you're grazing right through the fall, and I don't know which way to fall, though. It seems like it's that's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah. Um, did everybody get a question? Uh, there's, there's a little bit of controversy whether or not we should be grazing in the fall or should we be resting that grass to potentially let those carbohydrates build into the system um, to help keep that plant so it will survive through the winter time. In my case, I never really grazed below six or eight inches. I try to keep keep those those plant the plant height up, and most generally they'll tell you not to graze lower than say four inches. Um, so I keep on going. This every, every day the livestock's out there is a good day. Every day they're in confinement is a really bad day. So if you leave enough time, enough to keep the roots going. Yeah, you're not going to actually set those. If, if you do the grazing half leaf half thing, you're not going to potentially uh, cause those roots to slough off. Yes, sir. And if you vary the timing of the field from year to year with that grass height, that also accomplishes the expanding of the field of the grass height. Right. Right. I'll have any other questions. 
Yeah, they didn't answer their reading earlier. Uh, you were uh, flipping the other my grass growth period in the spring. Uh, so uh, you're intensive crazy. I'm intensive and crazy. And your high is starting to break helps in the short duration class. Right, right. But we, we are flipping uh, just because we don't want to put the solar panels on. Yeah. But yeah, you know, we have a lot of growth in the spring. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll just go ahead and comment on the extended grazing. Generally, your grazing that has the grass is born, and so carbohydrate will be more strong. Well, I think pretty much like his question was for continuing to graze clear through the period when there should be a rest on that grass. Um, so, typically, you know, it's not, it's not really dormant there, you know, before, before it was true. Did I have a question up here? Yes, sir. Have you ever used any bale grazing? Bale grazing, yes. Bale grazing works exceptionally well if you have uh, poor fertility. If you have poor fertility and you want to jump start that system and get your biology in there, bale grazing works exceptionally well. Um, there's different ways of doing it. Typically, we'll roll hay out on top of snow. If we don't have any snow, we'll use round bale rings. It causes a little bit of a, a spot in the field, but if, if you have cows like mine and you roll a, a bale out on, on soil, you have those cows, my whole this weight cow, she's really got a bad habit of this, she'll walk right down the center and then she'll drop a few cow patties and they should eat on it, so then we waste a lot of hay. So um, typically I'll put it in a round bale ring up there's no snow on the ground. Yes, sir. How do you set up your temporary fence? Like going out? How do I set that up? Yeah. Very, very interesting. Maybe I should draw this. I asked for this board, so I better use it, I guess, huh? Maybe I can show a lot of things, and I think I'm running out of time, but we'll have. Yeah. We've got a couple minutes yet? Yeah, you got a couple. I got a couple. Okay, so I'll make it quick so that I don't. Don't uh, critique my drawing too much. Hopefully everybody can see this. Let's just say this is a paddock that we win. I mean, five acres, two acres, ten acres, doesn't matter. Okay? How do I set my fence up? You've been to the farm, haven't you, Tom? Yeah. We have. You need to come up. Okay, what I'll do, I may have to cross, I may have three or four fences already set, so we're going to naturally, we're going to run right over them. We're going to go in there because we're in a hurry to listen to the birds chirp first thing in the morning. But whenever I set fence, I'll set two fences at a time. We try to be very, very efficient at it. I use the mini reels. I'll hang two there. I'll walk. I'll set my fence the whole way across. I'll go up here with the second wire. And I'll set my fence back, reel my other mini reel up here. I get two fences set in less than 20 minutes. It works very, very well. How far apart is your foot? It's kind of real. Yeah, 16 steps. It's 18 steps. In corn or some really thick, dense uh, stuff that I'm setting in, I may go as small as six steps. So. I'm a little guy, so I'm less than less than three foot a step. Um, so, where's your water? water? Where's my water? That's another good question. Um, we have hydrants. You've seen the hydrants all over the farm. Okay. Uh, we had we used to set our tubs in along this interior fence, or our say this is our perimeter fence. We used to set them, but we used to get a lot of tramping, a lot of problems with our soil. We used to have a lot of bare spots, and that wasn't acceptable to me. So one of the things to solve that, typically, say we're going that way, we'll hook onto this with 200 feet of garden hose, we'll bring it down here, we'll bring it out into here, maybe 30 or 40 feet. We eliminated those bare spots by doing so. I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's how the cows come up with water, and they, but we've eliminated any compaction or any bare spots around that water tub. So that's where my water's at. We move them ahead, we move that water tub. Tim, he's timing, it takes less than a minute to move cows and the water tub. 
less than a minute. For that whole entire herd to go through here, or take this now, wind it back, the entire herd to go through, move the water top, put the fence back up, less than a minute. Yeah, if, if you folks want to leave your email, we do have field days scattered throughout the year. Um, you know, you're more than welcome to come up to the farm. We're, we have one now that we're planning for August. So, in, you have my, you know, we're planning on Troy Bishop. It's not 100% yet. We're going to try and get Troy Bishop onto the farm. And I'm sure there'll be some other ones. You have my contact information. You can shoot me an email. And, Say, hey, I'd like to be on, a, on your list to be invited to a field day, or if you have any questions, shoot me an email. If you dial that phone number, you will reach my wife, and she will take the message and relay that to me. I think so, Dick. Yes, I think that's the plan. It, uh, it's a grazing school in the western part of Pennsylvania. GLC. GLC. Yeah, GLC is funded a grant for that, yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You rotate, rotationally graze your goats? Yes. I rotationally graze my goats. Um, typically, the goats and sheep are only moved once a day. Now, we're right in the middle of lambing season. We will hold them three days. Because if you've ever moved sheep whenever they're lambing, it's not very fun. Um, so we only go through that for three days. but. Our temporary fencing, if we just have the sheep, we use two wires. If we have the goats, we use three wires. The reason we were using three wires is the one guard dog has to have the jump over the fence. We're just using poly wire. Our fence is hot. One of the tricks with that is you need a fence if the, the, the voltage needs to be over 5.5 thousand volts. And we're using three. There are six stainless steel wires and three tin copper wires in our uh, as our temporary. It carries the voltage better and how long it would hit. And actually, my fencer usually just hit around 10,000 volts. It really makes you mad if you get up against it. <laughs> especially, especially if you get hit four or five times in one week and it's wet out. It's yeah. not fun. What kind of energy? I'm using a stay fix, and it's actually 36 joules, so it's, it's got a little pump behind it. It'll make you cranky if you get up against it. <laughs> my, my poly wire, there's a lot of different places that have good poly wire. Primer has good poly wire. Gallagher has a good poly wire. Uh, Kenko has a really good one, too. That's the last one. Officially, you can stay and visit here as long as you want. Yeah, I'll be here. I can be here. You know, I'll be glad to talk to any of you folks. Leave your evaluations at the end of the table. And if you have your West Virginia News and Ranger license, you can see you in the session. Russ, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.